Eu te, tu lá tu lhe, a vez mal feita lá tu lhe, a vez lá o leu feita a vara e faz mais suí ou mais tou, ao final o engano mais mal estudio, mais hope trust, o te feita lá o feito, mas feita feito aí a tu para ir mal mal o tato mais tanga. Um, yeah, it's a honor and privilege to be up here. Sorry, excuse this hand. I'm going to be waving this thing around today. Um, but yeah, it's an honor and privilege to be here in, in this space. Uh, it was an absolute. I think this morning sessions was quite dense. Um, but if anything, it really resonated with the work that we've been doing over the last few years. Uh, so I should make a disclaimer. I think the last time I presented in front of our Pacifica community was back in 2018. And I think I pissed off a few uh, <laughs> MPs and people from uh, Ministry of Pacific Peoples, but I uh, changed my name, cut my hair, and I'm back. <laughs> Stronger than ever. Anyway, uh, oh, actually, no, that's a lie. But um. Yeah, so I'm going to present a little bit about the research project or practice-led research project uh, that we've been working on for the last 12 months, but really it's an extension of a lot of the work that we've been doing over the last 7 to 10 years, particularly in the Pacifica housing space, before there was even the Pacifica housing space, um, but, and also trying to complement a lot of the discussions in the corridor that was, that was had this morning. So I also just want to mention, Rowena, that I'm a big uh, I'm fangirling right now, um, particularly after your presentation this morning or earlier on this afternoon. But just want to give a big mihi to you and your team for holding the space and uh, with such mana and such eloquence and but also leading the pathway for a lot of us younger fiapoko professionals coming through. So uh, before I get into the research project, I thought I'd just talk a little bit about why I'm doing this kind of work uh, because it contextualizes everything that I'm doing. Uh, so, I am one of 12 siblings, and I'm just in, uh, you know, as a response to some of the conversations this morning, was, and something that I don't often talk about, and particularly around my family, because, you know, these things can be quite sensitive, uh, but a lot of the work that I do now is an extension of, of my family, and so there was some conversations around early migration, specific migration, so my father was and one of those migrations in the 1950s and 1960s is, was, and was quite instrumental in starting the PIPC over in Newton. Uh, and during his time and when him and his first wife settled, they were supporting a lot of our Pacifica communities, whether they be Samoa and Tongan and Cook Island, coming into Auckland and settling, settling and setting up their own families. Um, my mother, Tala so my father's from Ngatai Vain, Balawli. Uh, in Samoa, and he's also whakapapas back to Valvai, Saleidua, Bautasi, Falilili in Samoa. And my mother's also from the same village, they're not cousins, by the way, just uh, letting you know. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> shouldn't go there. But, uh, no, so, and my mom, um, you know, through the time and through having us, us uh, younger ones, you know, her motivation was her people and very similar to a lot of the stories in this, in this room right now. So she took that motivation and she went, and went ahead and got a, a social work um, qualification and has been working in a social, as a social worker for the last 15 to 20 years. And a lot of the conversations that I have about design and architecture is actually with my mom, who's a social worker, because every day she's either connecting families to the housing over in Mont Cecilia or with Benina Trust, you know, just put a family uh, with Benina Trust last week. But she's just talking about some of the practical realities of our Pacifica families and housing here in Aotearoa. Um, so out of the 12 siblings, I think we have like four who went into real estate uh, and uh, some of my siblings moved overseas. And you know, as much as my father and my mother were doing community development here in Aotearoa, they pursued international development and finding ways and their skill sets to support our most vulnerable communities. And so, <clears throat> okay. Uh, which brings me to myself. I often ask my uh, parents uh, who was their favorite child, and it's me, of course. Um, but I'm an ex-graduate of the greatest school in the world, De La Salle College. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And that was me when I was 12 years old, by the way. Uh, but my journey with architecture, as much as it was an extension of my upbringing, so I moved around a lot when I was young, so you know, resonating with some of the stories this morning around our families owning homes in central Auckland. So our family had a family home in Herne Bay. 
Then when my parents separated, we moved into a state house over in Devonport. Then when my mother remarried, we moved over to a state house over in Manurewa. And the story goes on. So I moved from house to house. And so this reality of the world was not your typical, but it is typical for Pacifica families. But my ideas of space and place was completely different to a lot of the people that I was sharing the classroom with. Um, so that jumps, jumping forward to um, year nine, at the greatest school in the world. And I was quite a cheeky fella. Uh, you won't notice, obviously. Um, but one of my favorite classes was graphics or design visual communications, as it's called now. And I got kicked out of class one day, and he said, do not come back until you have a good story um, for me to let you back in the class. And so I walked around school for like two weeks. I didn't go to class for two weeks. I don't know why. Don't ask me. Um, but then I realized that I really missed graphics, and I really missed DVC. And so I went and spoke to my career advisors and asked them, well, where can graphics and DVC take me? And they said architecture. So I wrote a little note and passed it over to my teacher, and he said, well, you can come back into class. And that, what that letter had said is that I wanted to become the greatest architect in the world. I didn't even know what architecture was back then, but um, it stuck with me. And what I had written that letter you know, was just an idea at that point in time, but then became my motivator to get through school and then became my passion and it continues to be my passion today. And so graduating from the greatest school in the world, uh, De La Salle College, I went to Unitech School of Architecture where it was interesting going from a classroom or a school which is 99.9% .9 Pacifica to a classroom which was 99.9% non-Pacifica and just a total clash of worldviews. And I, I think my first two, three years was, was difficult because as we're probably all experiences, a lot of the learning content and education is not necessarily teaching us the way that we've been raised and our worldviews and our beliefs and our value systems. So we're learning about architecture from, I don't know where, I can't even remember now, I probably didn't turn up to class. But, you know, I was disengaged and went, went through my first two years of university with that mentality. So I was getting low grades, low engagement. I'm doing everything else but my school, schooling work. Um, but then in third year, we had an opportunity of doing a practice-led project, which we spent the whole year uh, designing social housing or affordable housing for a family out in West Auckland. And that really sparked something in me around, well, this really is where the alignment, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, the alignment between my value systems and growing up as a Pacifica uh, young male in Aotearoa, uh, but also around how I can use my skill sets to then support our most vulnerable families. And that was really the catalyst. So I graduated from my bachelor's and then moved into the Masters of Architecture program. And fast forwarding a little bit, but in our fifth year, we uh, tasked with a research project. So we spent 12 months on a research project. And for me, I really wanted to dive a little bit more into my culture uh, and around how architecture and our built environments in Aotearoa can reflect our Pacifica value systems. And so I delved into Le Malo Fier or the Tzau or the Be'a, however you want to pronounce it from where you're from. But I started delving in, and at this point in time, I had no understanding of what Malo Fier was or a Tzau was. And that could be a lot of our, a lot of our um, youth going through don't understand the meanings behind the patterns. And so what I had done with the tatao was I stripped the patterns down and started understanding, well, what did each pattern mean and what were the relationships between the different patterns and how did that really define my role as a Samoan male with inside my family and my, and my community. So without getting into it too much, it's, you know, from a thematic perspective, it's really broken into, down into three parts. So the, the, the higher parts of the tatao was around protection and navigation. Uh, the second part is around the importance and the, I wouldn't centralization is the wrong word, but just censoring knowledge systems and the importance of males protecting our females or vice versa with inside our community. So there was that mutual relationship, which, and then lastly, and something that's not often spoken about with inside our education system is around our courage and our bravery. And the, the lower part was really around the dark rendered part is the ocean, which represents our challenges and our barriers, which 
which really define us in navigating that process and those barriers, etc. And so it's all around who we are, who we are, and who are we in the face of adversity inside our community. And then eventually I got to a point of we had to take our process and develop a sense of an architecture of some sort or built environment. So for me, I use that process to, de to develop uh, which effectively means protecting Samoa's treasures here in New Zealand. And it was a space which was dedicated to Samoan tattooing or Moana Nui tattooing arts and artists and leaders. But it's around really the preservation and the celebration of who we are in Aotearoa and navigating these new spaces. So, gosh, okay, there we are. And then I, I, I finished uni uh, and then was really left with, and this is, it's, it's sad, but it's a common reality for a lot of our Māori and Pacifica architectural students and design professionals coming out of uni is having to choose, is it community or is it commercial? And you sit in a room, an office for the next five to six years or seven years and 10 years, however long, and work towards becoming a registered architect, but you're detailing balustrades and you know, doing ablution blocks, and I'm not saying it's bad, but you know, it just sucks the living soul out of you. Or do we take a risk? Or do I, do I take a risk and jump into community architecture where I can actually be of value and be of benefit to my people? And I chose the latter one. And I was fortunate and privileged to have been given that opportunity by the Roots um, Creative Entrepreneurs who are based in Otara. And we really started designing and developing spaces which our youth could engage with and making educational learning environments accessible to our South Auckland youth who won't get these opportunities in school. And then just jumping forward, then I moved over to uh, New York and worked with Architecture for Humanity Worked in an amazing bar, by the way, and that was, uh, it, was, it was fun. And then jumping forward to Philippines and then finally landing back in Samoa, where I was challenged by my chief and my, my elder around, well, why are you doing all of these things overseas, but you're not doing anything for your people here in the Pacific and in Aotearoa? And so I just sat down and I asked myself these questions and just trying to hone it in to reflect our you know, the themes of, of the presentation today, but how do we meaningfully regenerate Pacifica lived experiences and worldviews into built environments in Aotearoa? And how do the outcomes of this process enhance our sense of identity, belonging, and resilience? So um, we, in that process, in 2017, we formed a design and development practice. So I was getting sick of uh, being fired everywhere else, so I thought I'll start our own practice. Um, so there were four of us young Māori and Pacifica architectural graduates, and we were, were faced with that challenge of answering these questions. Well, how do we create a sense of place and identity for our Pacifica and Māori communities here in Aotearoa? And so this has taken some refinement. It's, we've, we just turned six last week. Gosh, yeah, just turned six last week. And it's been an absolute process. But we realized that in order to do this meaningfully, it's not just design and it's not just architecture, but it's design and development. It's building the capability and the capacity of our communities to deliver this work for themselves. And so I think in the process of refinement, you're supposed to come down to one or two things that we ended up expanding out. But effectively, Mal Studio is not, we deliver architectural design, um, architectural, architectural design services design education, business development, and research and development services. And with the intention of supporting and wrapping around our Pacifica and Māori communities and delivering built environments um, for our people. And so as we know, Māu is a, a pan-Pacific term. So every, or most Pacific nations have a def definition for Māu. So for, um, for one, or for some, it's around um, to strive or to persevere or to hold firmly onto. Uh, but also Mao was critical or in certain points in Pacific genealogy and history, Mao surfaced as movements. So you had Le Mao Opule or the Mao movement in Samoa in the early 1900s, which ultimately led to the independence of Samoa in 1962. 
He had Mao Piolu, who was a Satawalese navigator who regenerated Polynesian voyaging, which has ultimately led to the re-identification re of Pacific peoples today. And then you had Tina Ngatza's Kia Mau, you have Lemi Ponifacio's Mau, and that def they define Mau as your creative sovereignty or for us as your mana motuhake. And so we then took some of these concepts and what does our Mau mean today? And what can, what really, the, what is the intersection? We really need a new clicker. But what is the intersection of these services? So we've tested this over the last six years around what does education look like, architectural services look like, business development and research and development look like in certain spaces. And an example of that is in 2021, we ran education programs with youth, with youth from South Auckland, particularly in Mangere, around the design and development of their streetscapes outside Mangere College in Papatoitoi, and also you'll see some street art over Monaco, right outside Grid Monaco. And what makes me proud is that 10 students from South Auckland worked on that, right from the conceptualization right to the actual implementation, and ultimately were accredited through that process. Uh, so they all gained NCA uh, accreditation. We also wove in work from the School of Architecture. So we had four students who were currently studying um, and mentoring and, and taking the students through that process. But also as Mao Studio, we worked on the technical design, developing the feasibility studies, et cetera, et cetera, to get to that point. And we're fortunate enough, there were, I think there were like 70 or 80 projects across the country and fortunate to be chosen as one of the top eight or top 10 projects particularly around the systems change in response, in response to societal or community needs, but also in the building the capability and capacity of our own youth to implement these projects in South Auckland. And so we then went on and we've tested this model across a number of different typologies or capacities. So for example, we took uh, university students over to Samoa and ran a three to four they workshop with Tufunga Fale Fale to really understand what does Fale making or Fale building or someone's architecture and space mean to Tufunga Fale Fale, but also bumping into issues around what well, indigenous architecture and cultural architecture, you know, is not a decline, but it's a threat of losing those knowledge systems. Uh, moving on to Ihumata Popokainga, working with the amazing Jackie and Hannah and, and Maya back in 2018, and finally getting to a point now where we're able to employ uh, Hana, uh, but also developing housing solutions with Hapu and with Iwi in South Auckland, uh, working across community centers, um, which is drug and alcohol addiction facilities in Mount Eden, and then speaking about streetscapes. So we, you know, had, have taken this across a number of different typologies, but always landing back at the same questions. And, you know, the questions that I asked myself during just leaving uni were the same questions that these organizations were asking themselves. The demand was there, the need for it was there, but the know-how wasn't. And so that's really the, the context to the research project. And fortunately, fortunately enough, uh, we sat down with Ruth and Rihi from Building Better Homes, Towns and Cities, and they really put up that wheel or that challenge around, well, what does that mean for housing Pacific peoples in Aotearoa. And so from there was really the, built the foundations to Alalanga, which is our practice-led research project by Pacifica for Pacifica. And it's a, 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 currently it's a research partnership between Mel Studio and Hope Trust. And we have a number of, uh, uh, an advisory committee um, made up of Moana Nui and Māori Pacific professionals in developing that research project. Uh, but coming back down to the foundations of the project is ala and ara is very similar to mao. It's a pan-Pacific term. And so for some Wananui communities, it means, means to spring, to arise, or to vitalize, uh, breaking of the waters, like to long, um, when, and during childbirth. So ala is literally giving life. Uh, and the philosophy behind it, you know, if you want to talk about Alba Wenten, and Alba Rafiti, ever moving present, but for us with defining ala, or alalanga or alanga, a living system system of connections that regenerates our Moana Nui ways of being. And 
everyone's in the housing space, so you've probably heard all different types of terminologies and buzzwords thrown out there. But for us, ala or alanga is regeneration. This is our vehicle to regenerate our ways of being into built environments in Wananui. Um, so, because being a practice-led research project, and I'm just wanting to hone this in and trying to make this as practical as possible for everyone so you can see yourselves in this research project. But as I mentioned, it's a research uh, partnership between Mouth Studio and, and Hope Trust. And the outcomes of the research project is the development of unique design frameworks, housing typologies. Um, we've also been in, in discussion with Kaing Order around the development of pilot projects in Mangere or in South Auckland. And lastly is really interrogating what do support systems look like for our peoples. Um, at the center of it, as a practical outcome of the research project is that these are resources developing specifically for Hope Trust. Uh, but at the center of it, we're seeing that these are resources which also could be, one, influence the development of resources for other Pacifica housing leaders or organizations to have your very own frameworks and narratives really going off that theme of mana motuhake. I think we've seen frameworks and principles and methodologies right to the horizon, and none of them make sense for any of us because it's really a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, but really where we see this is that this can become a tool or a guideline for you to create your own frameworks and methodologies and your own systems. And then lastly, once we start building up those systems and your methodologies, whatever it may be, is that that reinforces the wider Pacifica housing system. So that manamotuhake lies with us as the independent organizations, but then finding ways for governmental or education institutions to support you in your space. Uh, I know we've, we've spoken about this, but I just want to touch, that there's a, touch on that there's a strategic alignment between the research project as well to Whale Inga. So as we're all aware, Whale Inga has four main priorities. The first one is build intergenerational Pacific wealth through home ownership. Second one is build affordable, quality, healthy, fit for purpose homes for Pacific peoples. Third one is develop and grow the Pacific housing sector. And the fourth one is strengthen housing systems to improve housing outcomes for Pacific peoples. I think these priorities are well and great. And I just want to give a big mihi to the team for developing this because it's been a very long time. If not, this is the only strategic document that can bring us together, whether it would be good or for us. But it's a, it's, a, it's a platform for us to be connecting into. But where this research project comes in valuable and the added value of this research project is, we still have identified that although the strategic document is great, our Pacific peoples are still under-resourced in the implementation and the delivery of our housing projects in Aotearoa. And so in alignment with that, it's going back to this framework or going back to these outcomes is that we see that the research project can actually start or tease out what that developmental system or that housing system can be for us and by us. And so we see that kind of moving on. So yeah, as, as I mentioned, these are the practice, practical outcomes of the research project or the design projects. So I'm just going to go around each one of these points and just touch on what exactly is the outcome of these things and what has been our process in getting there. So in developing our very own framework, so we're seeing the framework or frameworks as the catalyst for systems change. If we don't have the frameworks, then we're going about things loosely and unintentionally. And so in the process of developing our own framework, we've identified, these are only like half of the frameworks that we identified, but these ones make most sense to everyone in this room. Um, but the top four, as we've all identified, the Māori housing space is well developed. There are frameworks which make absolute sense to hapu and to iwi. And so Modi Order Compass being one of them, Te Aranga Principles, the Mahi Framework, and the amazing work that Puranga Kura have done with Tapuya Marae, Aturanga Kite Marae e Toiwana. Those are examples of place-based and cultural frameworks which, frameworks which make sense, which aren't a one-size-fits-all, but is very specific to organizations and places. And then on the Bottom row, uh, examples of international or Pacifica-based framework. So you have the Yavu framework, which I think is a community engagement framework developed by MPP. The seven principles of regeneration. So in Canada and the Mohawk tribe, they developed regenerative principles based on their value systems 
and processes, Fono Fale, which I'm presuming all of us are well aware of, and then the work that Carlo Mila have done during the Mana Moana program in New Zealand leadership provides an incredible resource and in understanding what does well-being look like for Moana Nui today. And so one of the, going through this, we've identified, well, these are all great, but it's actually not specific for housing and built environments um, for us who are in that space. So I'm not too sure if everyone can see this. Um, but in that process, or as part of the research project, we're trying to develop a framework which is anchored in our value systems and our spatial concepts, but also picks and pulls at some of the successes of the frameworks that I had mentioned earlier. Uh, so as you can see here on the left, is touching on concepts such as Vamuana, Manamuana, Modi Moana, but it's starting to look at frameworks as a series of layers. I'm not gonna get into this because I can already see someone sleeping at the back there. Um, but looking at self, looking at the center, looking at the systems, but also looking at how, what's the value of, what is the value of the society. Um, should also mention too that we've been working alongside uh, Albert Fiti in the development of a, a, a PhD for the development of Malmwana. Uh, so that then becomes a resource which can be used by Pacific organizations uh, in this space. But where I, I believe the point of difference of Mamwana comes into is that, again, it's not a one-size-fits-all, but it's a process and it's a systems approach for organizations to develop your frameworks which make most sense to you and your communities. And so in this process, we started developing a framework with and for Hope Trust. Uh, and drawing upon the narratives of navigation, but also understanding the different environmental elements, which was important for navigators to get through that. So I'm not gonna get into this too much, but the outcome of it is a framework which is specific for Hope Trust. Uh, and the second part of uh, another component of the practice-led project <laughs> is the development of housing typologies. So also seeing that another gap with inside the development space is we're seeing developers, construction companies, design companies come forward with their solutions to specific organizations and Maori organizations, which fit inside their own funding models, their own financial models, their own financial systems, which do not make sense to us. And so in, in the development of these housing typologies and seeing it as a resource which can be spread across the sector is that we've identified different innovative cultural housing projects or communal projects so Mahitahi being one of them based in Otara, Toyota co-housing down in Dunedin, Kainga Totahi over in Ngati Whatua, and Kotuitui, which is based over in Manukau, or Wiri more specifically. Um, and then starting to then look also in the Pacifica housing space, uh, but also international case studies. So we have, for instance, the half house and in developing innovative social housing or community housing models, which grow with the families. Nightingale, which is looking at sustainability, so forth and so forth. Um, but also I just want to mention that there has been some work that Kaingora and, yeah, Kaingora have been developing, uh, modernizing Pacifica homes. So that was Jazmax and Lamatone. Haven't, haven't seen that, but I just wanted to put, there, put it there just, just there. But also drawing on my own experience of working with Pacifica and Maori organizations and their frustrations at wanting to integrate their cultural worldviews into their housing projects, but working with project managers who just have no, well, empathy in that, and so won't move outside of their own frameworks and their own processes to integrate our ways of living. Uh, so, and then moving into contractors, again, we're just looking at system after system, which is stopping us from reaching our potential. And so, I just want to touch on this a little bit. Can everyone see that? Again, sorry, it's just black and white floor plans, but something that we're, that we're doing is looking at different typologies, like whether it be a three bed or a four bed or five bed I know probably everyone hates hearing a number of bedrooms, but um, understanding that there are financial constraints in this, so we want to be like realistic about it, so not trying to go far left and develop something which is never going to be built but trying to find a middle ground between our financial structures right now, but also a fit for purpose model, which is for our Pacifica family. So drawing upon all the research and the outcomes and the themes come out of our, our, our case study analysis, it's just looking at a, 
A typical three bedroom floor plan working with inside a certain square meters, 110, 130 square meters. Um, and then also, oh, and then designing a floor plan that is fit for our people. So looking at multifunctional spaces. So, so if you can't hear me, but this is level one and level two. And so when someone, and then being in Mangere and the floodplains, et cetera, trying to elevate that off the ground. But so being responsive to that, but also seeing that elevating off the ground is a sense of safety and security for our people. And so we're still working on the ramp, so don't be too technical, please. Uh, but also looking at each space as multifunctional. So moving into the living room, looking out to a malaya of some sort, but that living room is open plan to the kitchen, but also can be broken off and compartmentalized. So during Fat Lovey Lovey or Tangi, that space could be isolated, particularly for our families. And then the kitchen being used separately, so from a Tapu and North perspective, the same with inside that boundary. As I had mentioned, my mother is a social worker. She goes around to Kainwara houses or whatever house, which is, and she takes elders or, or, or our own families or families with children. And seeing the houses is, one, the footprint's too small, but secondly, there's not a bathroom and a bedroom on the, on the lower level, which instantly rules them out from, from that and from an accessibility perspective. So just going, in, going into the practical needs there of having a bedroom and a bathroom on the ground. But in the second floor, we're seeing an opportunity to have a more of a multifunctional space. So still working with inside the parameters of our typical floor plan in square meters, but how can we allow that space to grow as the family grows, as well as working with inside the sales values and the rents, et cetera, et cetera. But at first we can design and build three bedroom homes but as the needs for the family grows, the house can grow with the family. And so as the family lives in it and, and understands their needs, that three bedroom can then become a four bedroom or a five bedroom or a combination of, of each. So it doesn't have to be a static and stagnated three bedroom, but something that grows with the families. And so I've been taking some of those, oh, Wow, we've been taking some of those concepts and applying them to three stories, multi uh, or medium density, high density, etc. But also understanding, oh, so taking those typologies and then working on pilot projects in, in Mangere with Kaing Order, they've identified two super lots. Uh, but the first challenge that Hope Trust have put out to Kaing Order is we don't want to work within your yield system. Because if we're going to take the small parcel of land and put four houses in it, one, you get the driveways. Sorry, really, no, I know there's driveways in here, but we can make them <laughs> multifunctional. But as, um, we don't want to work to the capacity of that land block, but how can we pick, pick and pull at the land block so that allows for spaces for play for our children, um, doesn't compartmentalize the houses, but also opens up spaces for communal living. And so, um, we, to get to this process, I don't want to take you through every single step, but to get to this process, we've taken the design framework and taken each one of those strategies and frameworks and applied it as design site strategies. So this is all being strategically placed in design. So these are the two blocks and pilot projects that Kind Water have put forward. Uh, and then you can see the typologies in context. So started adding some visual flair. I think that's why we went to school. And so that's potentially what uh, one of the pilot projects would look like. These are your three Betty houses, which are incorporating our cultural narratives, design narratives, social narratives, every single narrative that you can think of, which is encapsulated in our framework, by the way. <laughs> See me after if you want to talk about it. Um, so that's a three, three uh, dwelling site. But I think I what I had put forward like four or five and we're like, no, no way, thank you. Um, and then Secondly, is moving into a dwelling which they had as a yield eight or a yield nine, but we said no to really fit with our principles and our framework and our own mana motuhaki. We want to put forward six houses which has social spaces, a malai which connects all the different houses, um, but also allows for transparency and security through passive techniques. So, um, those are just some examples of what those housing projects are looking like at the moment. Thank you very much, Hannah. I'm not taking all your credit, thank you. Uh, yeah, and then just lastly, just wanted to make this note before I hand it over to, um, hand, hand it over to uh, John.
But as part of the research project, we've just found that even the research project was quite tight and under-resourced, understandably. But we're trying to work out different ways which we can support Hope Trust in this process. So we've been develop, uh, supporting them in the development of a feasibility study, which will ultimately unlock the pilot projects um, and secure the housing and the land blocks for a housing project in Mangere. Uh, working through and around uh, picking and pulling at good professionals who can build their capability and capacity. I'm sure we've all come across professionals in the past which are there for their own agenda, which is unfortunate, but it's typical and it's standard. But finding people and the right people which can wrap around them to really uplift their manner in that space. And lastly, I just wanted to mention, um, we know a lot of organizations who wanted to engage a Pacifica architect or Māori architect, but didn't know how to, and didn't know if any existed. <laughs> I still don't know too, but anyway, we'll, um, what we're doing is that we're starting a, a, a collective of Tangata Moana architects and design professionals under the umbrella of Moana Loa. So at this stage, it's, um, it's being led by Abra Fitzi and, and Roe Hoskins, and some of us little Ulovales and Fiopokos. Uh, but um, yeah, with Eliana obviously being here, Hannah uh, and Charmaine. But seeing that, I think in a month's time, we're going to hold a hui and identify 50, 50 architects, Pacific architects and design professionals. The ambition with that collective is that we all then become uh, the support system for you in the delivery and implementation of your housing developments to ensure that they're anchored in our worldviews and our value systems. And so it's, it's ongoing, uh, and the support system is forever growing based on the needs of Hope Trust. And I'm seeing that that will grow with the, the Pacific housing sector at large, but I thought I'd mention that. So before I finish it off, I'm going to hand it over to John, who will just speak on a perspective from Hope Trust. Manu. It's a bit late now, so I don't have to go further. I just to make it short. There's a speech written by our managers, but she's not here, so I don't have to follow it. <laughs> um, let us go straight into um, to uh, hope and trust. But before that, before I go, I'd just like to acknowledge our ministry, our um, Minister for Pacific uh, Peoples, and Penina Trust for the presentation this afternoon. Thank you very much. That's really encouraging for us. Um, just a little bit about myself. I'm sure you all have children. When you tell them, don't touch, it's me, I touch. Don't go, I go. 2018, the development, government development, renewing all the, um, those state houses in Mangili. So they formed, organized the first community meeting and the first comment made by the community to the, the government who came over at the time was saying to them, you Palangi people, you come here, make money on us and then leave. From there on, I was thinking, as I said earlier on, the negativity of our people is the frustration they have been in the past. They still have that feeling. So what I do, I do the opposite. I went out and talked with our leaders of our community, especially our church leaders. And uh, that's how when we found working together with uh, Reverend Victor Poesi of the Ifakasa Church in Mangali East. And we um, get all the other church leaders, different de uh, denomination and different ethnicity. And it's a legal, um, the Hope Trust stands for Housing Our Pacifica Enterprise. It was registered. You know, members of the board are from all Pacific, um, all, all uh, representatives from Samoa, Tonga, New Wayne, Cook Island, Fiji, and they're all on the board. Um, so that's where trust is all about. I don't want to talk about the, uh, the visions because we're all the same as you, you are, but I'll just go straight into um, what the aim of Hope, Hope Trust is. What is Hope Trust housing project is designed by Pacifica, built by Pacifica, and managed by Pacifica, and that is us. 
hope trust. Hope trust philosophy, a coconut tree cannot bear apple fruit. An apple tree cannot bear coconut. I hope Just Homes project is a pilot um, initiative that the best solution to Pacific challenges comes from Pacific people themselves. We know and trust each other. We live together. We want to develop affordable quality housing solutions together. Pacific people have, been, have and had been customers for decades. So our goal is for our people to own our own homes. We want to be homeowners, not customers. Hope Trust is yet to build a Pacific design house. Even though we started in 2018, we focus on our people, about owning how to own, mainly focus on the consequences of not owning and owning a home. So those are the areas that Hope Trust are focusing at this stage until the Pacific Design House was ready with Mo Holdings here to design it. As you know, our people, the design of our house is in our brain, but that's not nowadays. We need in writing to show it to them. So we were so lucky to have Mo Holdings. I found him when he was, I was doing busking down Mangali County Center and he will pass. So uh, that's how we're going to meet. And Mo Holdings now doing the designing house for us. But every time when we go to example, Kaingora, they always say, where's the profile, John? You've got no profile, where's the design? But we just tell them exactly, the design is in our brain, all our Pacific leaders, they tell them how it is. In olden days, I remember back in Niue, I don't know whether you know where Niue is, and they build houses with no plan. It's all in their heads, but nowadays, in order to take the box of nowadays, we need a proper design. So that's how, so thank you to Mo Holdings. Our community are struggling for wisdom, knowledge and understanding of owning and buying a home. Thank you for the invitation and hope that of being here today will give me wisdom, knowledge and understanding. Because if I don't know anything, and I teach my community what I know, we will continue to be customers. Thank you. Thank you, John. It's funny how um, life works out. As I had mentioned, my dad was uh, quite influential over in um, PIPC Newton. And you know, years later, obviously, I, I think I met John two years ago. But he came over and he said, oh, is your um, dad Nono uh, Samoa? I said, yeah, and he went, wow, he was his, they were best friends uh, back in the day. So I think this is one way of, um, yeah, <clears throat> my father being evident in the space. So I don't even know why I'm crying. I think I'm nervous or something. <laughs> but it's, this work means um, a lot more to us than, gosh than just a research project or um, a design project, but it's an extension of, of who we are and, and what we stand for. And it's the same thing. And that's why we wanted to start um, Moana Loa because there's so many architects, Pacific architects out there with the same drive and the same motivation um, in supporting our people. So we do hope that everything that we develop as part of this process is, is beneficial and adds value to what you're doing. Uh, but I just wanted to, to finish here because I know we've, we've discussed a lot about housing systems or what does the system look like and as Rowena had mentioned, we, we need a solution or come forward with solutions. And in some senses, this is, this is our mau or this is our opinion. This is our solution putting forward to test, to pull apart or at least put forward to see where it can, where it can evolve. And for us, that housing system or the specific housing system needs education and it needs to build the capacity and capability of our youth and our rangatahi coming through the space. It needs business developers and people, well, particularly who are Pacifica or Māori, both an understanding of the financial systems which make these projects viable for us, but are by us and anchored in our values. 
you know, the role of research and development in the space. I know we've thrown out data and my friend over here has been quite vocal about it on our table, but who's, who's developing that research? Who's capturing that data? And sorry, what the word data, but who's capturing that? Who's doing that? And who's telling the story and who's telling the narrative? So if we can hold that with inside us and by us, um, then we're in a better place. And I know I've, I've said architectural design here, but actually that's the whole development. That's not just the architects, that's the quantity surveyors, that's the project managers, that's the topo topo topographical surveyors, that's the engineers, that's the, the builders. And we're really working hard to, to build that system and identify who are the builders out there and leaders in that space so that we can bring that forward as a full package as part of the solution that we, that we developed together. Um, so this is just a solution. It's, again, it's not the solution, but we hope it can evolve with time and with you. So, maro lab.